Hey everybody, welcome back to the bench. Um, here's a neat little thing I picked up the other day at an antique store. Well, actually it was probably a long time ago. This has been sitting for a while. I kind of picked it up and forgot about it. And then uh, I saw it sitting there and said, hey, I need to do this. So what it is, is a tube tester. And uh, let's pull the lid off here. Get it out of the way. And uh, you can see it's actually not in bad shape. I picked this up for, I think it was like 10 bucks or something. Really, really nice price. It's actually in good shape. I don't know if it even works or if I would even want to try it, but it probably does. Uh, it even came with the original manual. And it came with some probes. I guess somehow you can plug these in and you can check conductance, you know, like, like uh, continuity. And you can check tubes for noise. This that's pretty, pretty unique. I've never seen one like that. You could plug a set of headphones in there. I don't know if I'd want to plug something in there and then stick it on my head, but I don't know. We'll look at it. Uh, power cords, not perfect, but it's not it's not stiff. I mean, it's still pretty pliable. So we could probably plug it in and try it. Um, the scroll is bad for you know for scrolling. This is actually how you go and. Uh, by turning this you can see that's pretty common on these things they get messed up like that so uh, yeah so I thought maybe we would uh, do a little video on tube testers and uh, kind of restore this one and then and then try it out and maybe talk about a couple of the differences that you could that you'll find on the different tube testers okay so the first thing I want to talk about is the different kinds of uh, tube testers that are out there and there there's probably three or four different categories that you could break it down to um, but really there's three main ones you want to talk about um, the first one is just basically called a filament checker and all it really is is a tube socket with a just a continuity circuit of some sort whether it's a little light bulb or something and when you plug the tube into the socket, all it does is it checks the continuity through the filament circuit to make sure you don't have an open filament. Now, it really doesn't test anything else about the tube, so really those are the least desirable types of tube testers. They don't really give you any information that you couldn't find out with your own meter just by ohming out the, uh, the two filament pins on your tube. The second type is... Um, the most common one that you'll see out there and this is one I bought at a flea market when I was a little kid and I've had this probably since I was about 10 or 12 years old and uh, this one is made by Accurate Instrument Company and it's it's what we call a emissions tester and what an emissions tester does is it will apply voltage to your filament so it will heat the tube up just like a regular circuit will but it will also apply a small voltage a small current uh, it will basically tie all of the elements together so all of your grids and your your anode are all tied together and then you have your cathode and it will apply a small voltage you know just a DC voltage between the elements and if you get emissions from the from your cathode to your elements then this meter will deflect and it'll show you this is just um, kind of a microamp or milliamp meter that will basically show that the tube at least has emissions and then they have a little chart which will uh, by setting that chart it will adjust but you know by setting by setting these the sensitivity on here which is a pot that's kind of in in circuit with this it'll basically set this so that the range if the needle deflects within this green section the emissions are said to be good so the tube is theoretically good now there's a lot of flaws with testing a tube that way it, it's a very rudimentary test and it won't always tell you the truth and the other thing is 
there are times where the tube will read like it's bad has bad emissions when in fact the tube is actually good and when you put it into a radio it'll work just fine um, I've seen many many cases where a tube has tested very weak and then you take it out and you plug it in a little AM radio and it works just fine there's no problem with it all so really you cannot do a quantitative measurement with a uh, emissions tester um, now in if it's completely dead the tube went to air or something like that this will be do a good job of testing that because of course you won't get any emissions at all and if the tube is very strong you know the needle will go up really strong so you do get a little bit of of an indication but again it's really kind of a good bad test more than a, than a quantitative how you know what the tube how it performs the other thing that these little things can check is for shorts so if you look here there's that short little uh, short setting and if we set this switch to shorts and then rotate the selector it will check all the pins with reference you know to to, to one another for a short between the elements so if any of the elements have a, have a dead short inside of them uh, this little neon light will come on and indicate that there's a short so this will do a few tests and will give you a rough idea if a tube's good or not I've tested many many tubes on this thing and uh, it's served really well over the years now let's take a look at this other one now this one here that I just got um, is also an emissions tester so it's identical same same principle as the other one the only difference is it's got a larger meter easier to read um, it has the the manual built right in okay so every tube tester has these switches whether it's a rotary switch or these little toggle switches whatever it may be these switches actually configure what pins connect to what element of the test circuit so that you are properly putting the filament on the correct pins and you're putting your cathode on the correct pins and you're putting your anode and so forth on the correct pins and that's really what we're doing with these is we're arranging what what pin of the socket connects to what pin of the tube connects to what part of the test circuit and the little chart that comes with these is what tells you how to configure it for each individual vacuum tube type now the one we just looked at had that little book and if we open that book that book will actually show you how to set the knobs on that on that test set for any particular type of tube this one has the chart built into it so there's no book to lose and all you do is you would roll this and it will it'll scroll that little chart around there and you just scroll until you find the particular uh, tube that you're looking for and then you set the settings according to what it says so the first thing we have to do before we can even try this out is to remove this from the case and uh, take a look at it um, and see if we can fix this scroll hopefully and I'm hopeful that the scroll is intact and that it just has come loose from the from the little winding unit um, luckily this thing weighs under 10 pounds so I should be good lifting it and uh, so we're going to take it apart and check it out okay before I get ahead of myself here which I've already done kind of got excited taking this apart to check it um, let's talk about the other type of tube tester that's out there I'm going to take this clip hopefully when I edit it and kind of put it behind <laughs> this one here um, the other type is called a con transconductance or mutual conductance um, and there are some slight differences in them but basically a transconductance uh, tube tester and they work different in that they will actually fire up the filament just like just like a emissions tester does but it instead of tying all of the elements together and then just running the tube as a diode checking it as a diode it actually will put some bias onto the tube and it will apply an AC signal and a lot of times all they're doing is they're just using a uh, a couple of vacuum tubes and they're uh, they're just setting up a little oscillator circuit um, to uh, 
to put a little signal onto the grid and then it it tests the output of the tube with the meter and it can actually read the conductance conductance is the opposite of resistance so you have resistance is measured in ohms and conductance is measured in Siemens which is the t the term that we use today but the the old term is Mohs which is ohms spelled backwards so what we're testing is the conductance of that tube or its ability to conduct under bias and just like you have tube charts for these there's tube charts for the conductance however it can actually read in Mohs how many can how, how much conductance that particular tube should read if it's good so there will be a rejection point which is the minimum amount of conductance that's acceptable and then anything above that is considered you know better now some some of these testers get very elaborate um, and they they can check you know what a new tube versus a you know 50 percent of all kinds of different things and even when you do all of that it still isn't the same as testing a tube in a real circuit so you may ask why bother testing a tube well you do get an idea of how the tube works and the again I kinda like both checkers because the emissions tester can pick up some things that the uh, mutual conductance testers won't and vice versa now some of the really fancy high-end ones like some of the Hickox and things they have the ability to do an emissions test and a uh, transconductance test either or um, so those ones really can test the tube but again it's not the same a, a vacuum tube can act different when it is under full load so take a, a 6L6 output tube for instance you take a 6L6 and you slap it in this thing all it's going to do is light the filament put a real slight signal on it and the meter basically as much current as this or, or power as this meter needs to deflect is all the energy that's going to be flowing through that tube which is not a real world scenario because a 6L6 can dissipate 35 or 40 watts of power uh, off of the anode and the only way you can test that tube under load is to put that kind of energy into it so really a good tube tester a real world tube tester would actually apply a 400 volts or 450 volts to the plate of that 6L6 and then it would bias up that that grid until until you're getting you know an anode to cathode emissions of you know so many milliamps you know upwards 50 60 70 milliamps or more at that voltage and to create that amount of wattage being dissipated through the tube and that's really the only way you would know for sure and even with that you would have to check it under different frequencies to make sure that that doesn't cause a problem between the elements because these you know a lot of times these screen grids and things can can have strange effects only when you have certain frequencies applied to them under certain loads so no tube tester is perfect um, but they can at least give you an idea of the tube the tube can emit or you know or not that's really it so I just wanted to talk about that a little bit now you've seen in my other video that I some of the other videos that I've used that Heathkit TT1 and that one is a mutual conductance tester so it actually puts a signal into it so I have both types of tube, of tube testers but by and large I use the emission tester the most because a lot of times I'm not really interested in how good the tube is I just want to make sure that I get emissions at least I know the tube is safe to plug in and try and there's no shorts on it so anyhow let's get back to this okay I have all the screws out of this thing so let's uh, lift it out of here and Let's see what's in here and you can see there it is not much to it just a whole bunch of wires coming from a transformer and this transformer is going to have all kind of voltage taps on it and actually they're in really good shape we have a couple of them that are cracked here but um, nothing some heat shrink tubing can't fix 
and everything else looks really good the switches look to be in good shape but this little scroll chart we're gonna have to remove from here and get it out and see if we can get it fixed um, if you notice there's really hardly any electrical components to go bad in this thing there's one paper one paper capacitor um, over here and there's another paper capacitor right here a bigger one there's a selenium rectifier which we're going to remove that and replace it with a standard diode because these things have a tendency to go bad um, with age and that's really all there is a couple resistors that's it so this is a very simple emissions tester and all it is really doing is just like I said applying a voltage between uh, the cathode and the elements of the tube um, and heating up the filament that's it to see if, if it if you get electron emissions so let's take this out and see what it looks like all right we have this little scroll taken apart and it looks like it's going to be an easy fix um, it looks as if all they do is they just tape this to this little roll here and it looks as if just the tape the glue has come loose so all we have to do is just re-glue this back on here and we'll be good to go so uh, let me take this little stopper off of here and wind this on here and this thing should be ready to go you could see how well built this was um, these gears are actual solid brass um, very well built no, no plastic or anything this is all metal so this is a very well built little tester there that's better you can see we got this working really nice now and it's mounted in there and it's good now when I was doing this I noticed something here and that is uh, if you take a look see right there we have a cracked capacitor so even though there's only two capacitors we're gonna end up having to replace them so uh, we'll do that and we'll get some things cleaned up here and uh, we'll move on alright we're starting to get this cleaned off here just had to empty my solder pump here because this thing gets clogged I'm just going to clip this side out here. There, and that is a 0.47. Okay. We have those. And then we have to kind of try to figure out what we're going to do about this rectifier. I think a little 1N407 should work just fine. All right, and this wire actually goes all the way down onto this little pot here. And this trimmer pot, I'm sure it's in the uh, manual here what we're supposed to do with that. It's probably in a part of the alignment procedure for this, but we still have to get the rest of this mess off of here. When you have these great big gobs of solder like this in here, it just ugh, just clogs this all right up. You end up getting these big chunks of solder in here and it just fills the pump up. <laughs> all right. Hey, how about that? Perfect. Okay. Let's go check our schematic. All right, here's something pretty interesting. It's really hard to see on this printout, but with the camera, I can see it on the camera really well. See where the K is for cathode. Um, it says drawn backwards. So you can see that they want the cathode in to go here. And actually, this is the cathode. This is the anode back here and if you look at the way this is oriented it was it was put in this way 
like this and if we look at the face of it it says can we read that Let's see what it says K plus so there's your cathode so um, so right there's how it went so we have to make sure we get our new uh, diode in there in the correct orientation okay so I want to test this uh, selenium rectifier to number one see if it's good and number two see uh, if there's you know what the actual anode and cathode is so if we take our meter and we connect it in one direction it doesn't read anything and if we take it and of course I'm on diode check and if I take my leads and connect it the other way it still doesn't read so it doesn't read either way so maybe the diodes bad or is it actually this is a, a little trap that you can fall into selenium rectifiers don't read on a normal diode checker these little diode checkers only put a couple of volts out and it's not enough voltage to break one of these down so it won't work um, they don't have a 0.7 volt drop like a normal silicon diode would have so how do you test something like this? Well, I'll show you. Um, we have this same problem in the x-ray business because, uh, you know, an x-ray tube runs on up to 150 kilovolts or 150,000 volts. And we have very large uh, rectifiers that rectify that AC into DC. And they have very high breakdown voltages that you can't test with your meter, just like these selenium rectifiers here. So let me show you what I use to get around that problem. I use an extension cord. So in one end of the extension cord, I have a little night light plugged in. So it's just a little 7 watt bulb. And on the other end, I just have a normal AC power cord. You can buy these in any of your little home stores, just a you know, dollar or whatever. And then what I do is I take the cord and I, I peel it apart and I take one of the leads and I split it open. And then I just put these little crocodile clips or alligator clips on each side. Now, if I clip these together and I plug this light into my AC outlet, the light will light up. If I take these and disconnect them, it will unlight. Now remember, there's high voltage on this. There's AC mains voltage. It is very dangerous. So if you do not feel comfortable with this or do not know what you're doing, do not do it. Do this at your own risk. Um, I also suggest before you touch this to connect it or disconnect it to unplug it first. Okay, now, if we connect this together again, I'm gonna, and I plug it in, you see how bright that light is? Hopefully the camera's not going to mess us up. If we put our diode in series, the light is working at half brightness. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that with this camera or not. But if I go ahead and, and I touch this over here, see how bright it is there? See how dim it is there? So the reason it's doing that is the light is only, is only conducting when the diode is conducting in one direction. And you're using your 110 volts to break that down. So, well, right now, we know that the diode is good. What we still don't know, though, is what is actually the anode and the cathode, let's say. So let's say we want to find that out. Well, 
we can take a diode that is known good and we know the anode and cathode because of the stripe right the stripe is our cathode if we place this in here and we place this over here and we take another jumper cable and we connect it like this so you see now I have these two wired in series and if I go and plug this in now if you notice it lights up alright now if I take my my known diode and I reverse it and I plug it in notice there's nothing if I reverse this again the light lights up so let's find out let's take a moment and look at why that's that does that okay we're gonna just leave it wired like this and then we move this over to the side and hopefully nothing will fall all over the floor all right what we were doing is if we have our power our AC coming in all right if I go through the diodes this way if they're both going in the same direction and here's our light bulb right the light will light up if I have this one in backwards okay if one of them is backwards then it won't light up because you'll have two back-to-back -back diodes and it'll block in both directions so what that's going to do is as long as the light lights up we know that they're lined up if we know that one of the diodes what polarity it is so for instance we know the stripe is on this side on this diode then we know following this schematic that this must be the stripe of this diode so I can mark that now with my little sharpie with a stripe so that's my stripe okay and now we know the polarity of our diodes so now if if we remember how this was oriented in there all we have to do is connect this one in that same orientation and we'll be good but I just thought that would be a way you know any of you that work on these old all-american 5 radios and things that have these old selenium rectifiers in them they can be difficult to test sometimes but if you use this little nightlight bulb tester jig um, you can very easily number one check if it's good you know and number two check its polarity and that's how you do it so little tech tip all right we're back it's another day and uh, back on the bench here and we got this all finished up and if you take a look we got it all uh, restored this resistor was just dead on it's a 330 ohm uh, so I just left it alone you can see we have the new diode put in and what I did was <clears throat> I added this little dropping resistor in here it's a 47 ohm uh, this this probably would work if I didn't put that in there um, but there is a voltage drop whenever you use a selenium rectifier and there's only about a little little over a half a volt drop um, you know 0 0.6 0 0.7 volts across a silicone diode or silicon diode so you know you're if you want to match the voltage you got to put a little bit of a resistor in there and also this helps a little bit with current limiting and things too 
Um, we replaced the capacitor here and the capacitor here, cleaned all the controls. Um, I want to show you something here that I found that's uh, pretty neat. And it's these little uh, these little cleaners here. And let me show you how they how we get them. They come in little packs like this, and I they're used for actually for art for artists, and they use it for some type of paint, like for painting pictures um, or for ceramics. And I, I purchased this at a uh, one of the um, craft stores. Um, there's one there's a there's a chain of craft stores in the states here called Pat Catans, C A T A N S, Pat Catans. My wife shops there because she does a lot of sewing and things like that. And uh, they have a lot of neat things for electronics, believe it or not, that you know can be repurposed. And this is one of them. And these are really nice because they have this little swab on the end. It's not really abrasive, but about the abrasiveness of maybe a pipe cleaner or something. And they hold, uh, you can soak this with uh, Deoxit, the D100, and then you can get right in there and you can just clean stuff off like this real nice and get in there without, you know, hosing the whole switch deck down with the spray and it works really well. These also work really good in tube sockets as well. I use these and I also use pipe cleaners to clean out the tube sockets inside which is what we did. So just thought I'd share that with you as well. So um, anyways it's all set to test out. Everything looks good. There is one adjustment here but uh, there's no I can't find any instructions yet as to how to uh, adjust the unit with this but I have a feeling it's probably going to be okay. So let's uh, flip this over and see if we can plug it in and test a tube. Alright we're all together and uh, I thought maybe just before uh, we tested a tube I'd give you just a quick demo of how I clean these tube sockets. Um, the first thing I usually do is I'll get a little cup like this one and I'll take a little bit of deoxit and just kind of, and I like the D5 for this because it it cleans as well as puts the, you know, the protectant on there. The D100 doesn't have the cleaning; it just has the uh, the protectant, and that's what the 100 means. It's 100% of the protectant solution and no cleaning solution. So you dip it in there, your pipe cleaner, and then you can just go into like uh, here's the eight pin octal. I've did them already, but I'll do this one again. And you just go in and kind of clean it and just clean each one and uh, it's really nice because it puts the deoxid on there and it also does a little bit of kind of scrubs the pins off and there you go and then that way it's a lot better than you know I used to just take the spray and kind of spray it down in there and it would get all over the place and it was such a mess um, this this method works a lot better and there you go so uh, Let's see if we can test a tube. Okay, so I dug around in my junk tube box and I just pulled a random tube out and it is a, see if we can see this, it is a 12D4. So it's a 12D4. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to look up 12D4 and see if it's in here. So there's the 12A, 12B. 12C and 12DQ6 is the only one. 12D4 is not listed. Now that does not mean this tester will not test it. It just means that when this scroll was made that tube was not out yet. Now what I did was I went online and lo and behold they actually had a supplement with a whole bunch of more tubes that it can test. Let's see if the 12D6 is sixes, nines, 12, 12 G, 12, there's a whole bunch of 12 Ds there, 12 C, 12 D4, there it is, right at the bottom. So let's see if we can set this up. So for a 12 D4, the filament volts is 12, so we set that to 12 volts. 
filament volts or uh, letter F is switch number seven. So here's letter F, and we want to put switch number seven to letter F, and then letter N. You can see the letter N is pins one is switches one and two. So one and two goes to N, like that. Then P, position P, is switch number 5. So we take 5 and move it to P. All the other ones stay down. And then it says the filament control is on pins 7 and 8. So the first thing we'll do is we'll plug our tube in. We'll plug our tester in. Hopefully it will not explode. And we turn this on. And the first thing I'm going to do is switch this to line set and see if our line will set. So you can see there's your line. So let's adjust that. And oh, we forgot. There's one more setting also the load knob, and it's set to four. So we have to set load to four. There we go. I missed that. Okay, so when you do your line adjustment on these little testers like this, depending on the size of the filament, the filament can actually draw down that, the, the output. That's why this line adjustment will vary based on the type of tube. So if this was, were a little, like a little 12AX7 with a smaller filament, it would draw less current, so that meter would go up a little further, you'd have to turn it down. So I, you always want to set your line whenever you change tube types. Now, if I want to ch check 112 D4s, that's okay. Once it's set, it's set. But for this particular tube type, we have to set our line first so that the meter is accurate. Then we go up to regular, and there you go. The tube is good. It's reading 70%. So that's a pretty good tube. And uh, it looks like our tube tester is working. Now, this will also check for shorts. And I did not read how we check that on this, because it's a little bit different than uh, the one that I have. But let's see what it says about testing for shorts. I'll test for shorts. Okay, here we go. Insert the tube into the socket. Um, adjust your line adjust, rotate the load control all the way clockwise. So we'll go all the way here, go to short test, and you're going to move all these down one at a time. Move each lever except those previously placed in the F or N positions. Okay, my bad. <laughs> Read the book first. So, F and N is 7. F goes to 7. N goes to 1 and 2. That's probably your filament settings. Okay, now let's turn it back on. All right, and then it says... One at a time, move each lever up to the P position. Tap the tube and observe the neon indicator lamp glow when anything, any of the levers are moved to P position would indicate a short. So there you go. A slight glow may be disregarded when testing audio tubes such as the 6L6. No glow, of course, is desirable, but a slight glow may be considered passable. There you go. So, um, so really all we're going to do now is we're just going to move these up and watch the little light here. There it flickered. See, it kind of flickers, but it doesn't stay on. Okay, pin 8 stays on all the time. So what does 8 mean? 
a steady glow on any, any element listed in the filament continuity column does not indicate a short. It indicates filament continuity. So if we look here, filament is, let's see, 7 and 8. So since 7 is already up there, pin 8 means that you're on the filament, and that's why it's glowing. If you could see, it's glowing there. I don't know if you could see that, but it is lighting up pretty good. So there you go. That indicates that this is a good tube. And that's all there is to it. If we go back to, to that, um, there you go. So that is all there is to it, and um, it works. So very good. Okay, the next one we're going to do here <clears throat> is a 12AX7. And this is one of the ones that uh, was in the Ampeg amp. So we're going to test it out. And I'm sure that'll be in, this, in the chart here. So if we go to 12, 12AX7, there it is. And there's two different tests, if you notice. And the reason is, is this is a dual triode, meaning there are two tubes inside of one package. So you could see the one triode tube here, and you can see the other triode tube here. So there's an individual test for each one. So for the first one, we'll look up here. Filament voltage 12. F goes to 4. So there we go. N goes to 9. P goes to 2. and load is set to 3 and your filament continuity is 4 and 5 so we're going to set it to line voltage again I'm going to turn the voltage down right now for starters then we'll plug this tube in and you can see it hardly moves the meter at all because you know it's such a low low current draw on that tube so line that up then we go over to regular and there you go and this is an older tube um, I, I tested it on my TT1 uh, for transconductance and it tested very good so um, you can see under emissions it doesn't test as good but this actually tested very good on transconductance and that's one of the things I was going to say is that um, these may not agree with one another, you know, between a mutual conductance tester and, a, and an emissions tester. One of them, it could say the tube is weak or something, and the other one could say it's not weak. Which one do you believe? And that's why you got to kind of understand how tubes work. This is not an end-all answer, but it will tell you at least we know the tube has emissions, we know the filament is good, um, and we can check to make sure there's no shorts. Now, the next one, the only difference is all the settings are the same, but if we take P and we move it up to from 2 to 7, okay, so we take P and we shut it off, and we take 7, and you can see it's reading almost identical in emissions. Now remember, this is an emissions test. This is not a conductance test. So even though the numbers are the same, in other words, these both were reading around 65 or so, this is not matching a tube. In other words, we're not matching the two elements in here. Okay, that when you say you have, you know, matched uh, a matched set of triodes in a 12AX7, this is not the way you would match it. You would do it with a, with a mutual conductance test, and even those aren't perfect. Um, we had that talk earlier. But you can see we tested uh, both elements, and they both have emissions, and they both have good filaments, and they work. So there you go. So this is going to be a useful little tool here for the bench. Um, it's a good, good $10 investment, I think. So anyways, any of you that works on tube gear, 
I highly recommend you get a tube tester and you don't need to have a mutual conductance one although if you can afford it expect to pay about two hundred dollars or so online to find one that even works or that's fixable and they can get up into a couple two to three thousand dollars for the fancy ones um, if you do that much work with tube gear then you might be able to cost justify it but um, you know <laughs> it's a lot of money to spend but these little emissions testers are very good they serve a good purpose and uh, you can use them and they do help you they do help you out so uh, that's it for this one and uh, I'm just nothing left but to put the screws in it and uh, put it away and it's it's ready to go so uh, again we have another quick little video here I um, hope you enjoyed it and uh, certainly enjoyed making it for you all and and uh, doing this and uh, until next time peace joy happiness and good health in all your lives I wish you all the best and until next time take care bye bye